Hello, my name is Henry Vassell with the Rocky Hill Education Foundation. The Rocky Hill Education Foundation is an organization which raises funds through fundraisers and gives the money, 100% of it, back to the school system through grants and through scholarships for the students. Today we are interviewing candidates for the 2022 election. We will be giving them two minutes for an opening statement, five questions, and then a closing statement. And now we have candidate for State Representative District 29, Pankaj Prakash. Hi, Henry. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for hosting uh, this forum. Thank you to the Rocky Hill Education Foundation for hosting this forum. And uh, I wanted to uh, start with uh, something I, I hold really near and dear to my heart. Uh, my life story is in big part about education. And when I was growing up in India, I, my parents told me that my ticket to middle class was education, and they were right. I, uh, in my campaign today, I use uh, community, opportunity, and responsibility uh, as, uh, as something I, I kind of lean to, right? And education is all about opportunity. It's about if you're a kid in an underserved community today, whether you're white, black, brown, any color, any socioeconomic background, your ticket out of poverty is education. There is no more guaranteed outcome better than relying on education. And I, I truly believe that. And it will be safe to say that I'm sitting here today with the former mayor of Rocky Hill in this, I should say, the greatest country in the world, in large part because of education. So I came to the United States uh, as a student, and I have experienced America as a graduate student, as somebody who worked on a work visa, somebody who was a permanent resident, and then eventually as a proud American citizen. Um, I have lived the life of a teaching assistant, a restaurant worker, a professor, engineer, and an elected official. So I have gone through the American journey, and uh, I can tell you that education was a big part of that journey. So I truly believe uh, in outcomes, in, uh, in, uh, in outcomes for people, life outcomes, uh, which can be improved and enhanced uh, by solely by education. Um, and I'm running for state rap because I want to give back to the community uh, that has given me the opportunity to succeed. Uh, and that's why I'm running. Perfect. What is your vision for education in your district? Yes, uh, that's a great question. Uh, like I said, I have thought about this topic a lot, uh, personally and professionally. And uh, my education uh, platform or vision, as you said, uh, is based on uh, a few things. Uh, number one of which is like how we allocate money, how do we fund education, uh, educational outcomes, uh, teacher pay, uh, early childhood education, especially for disadvantaged communities, and um, last but not the least, a school choice. So those are like the, the pillars of what you will think of as my education uh, vision. And to start with, I would like to do is, I would like to look at the ECS, the education cost sharing formula, which I think is mostly based on today uh, on uh, demographics and location. Uh, and I would like that to be more based on education outcomes. Uh, because as we know, uh, I think, uh, education is not just about, you know, educational outcomes, but they are about economic outcomes. And it is about fundamental fairness. So what I want it to be based on is the idea of having uh, student achievement as one of the metrics in there, uh, in, and with the class size and the student-teacher uh, student ratio. So those are the things I want to bring into the educational uh, you know, uh, formula, the ECS as they call it, and see how we fund things. The number two on this is, uh, like I talked about, education outcomes. I'm 
I'm all for funding education to the maximum extent, like we have done for years in Rocky Hill, and we have results to show for it. Uh, we are top of our peer group, and we spend the least amount of money in our peer group. So it can be done. So I'm all about educational measuring, educational outcomes, and putting the money where it's needed, right? And I think we just have to do a better job. Government in general does not do a very good job of measuring outcomes, and education is not immune to that. I think we need to do a better job of measuring outcomes, whether it's our inner city schools, whether it's suburban schools, whether it's like rural schools. Uh, and I think we should spend the money accordingly. Uh, I would be amiss if I did not mention teacher pay. I think teachers, we are asking our teachers to do a lot today. Uh, our teachers are not just, you know, teaching in the classroom, but they are almost like parents today, acting like parents. Uh, and I think that's too much to ask. I think we should pay them better, especially in underprivileged communities, in inner cities, uh, where they carry a massive load. Uh, we, that should be recognized, and we should do the best we can do to actually recruit and retain them. And if that means higher pay, so be it. Uh, like I said, I'm not for not spending money. I just want them to, it to be spent and the outcomes being measured. And it applies to education as well. Uh, the, the last thing I will say is, I think early childhood education, especially in the disadvantaged communities, uh, and school choice. Those are two big ideas which we need to embrace. And experiment with them as much as possible because the earlier you get a child to read well, write well, or do math well, studies have shown that eventually that child does better in terms of the life outcomes, mm -hmm. the income, uh, the wealth, uh, you know, accumulation over lifetime. So I think we should, we should focus on those things. School choice, again, I think we have some of the best charter schools and magnet schools. I think we should, we should be giving more school choice to parents, not less. Okay. How can we better secure our schools? So this is, this is, a, this is, a, really, uh, this is a really important question today uh, and in the world we live in today. Uh, unfortunately, this is something we have to think about every day. And as a parent today, uh, as a parent of a 13-year-old uh, in my household, uh, living with me and going to the bus and the school and coming back from the school at 2.30, as a parent, I cannot separate uh, my uh, duties as public official and being a parent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that is always on your mind. Unfortunately, right, for all of us, for all our parents. So I feel, uh, you know, uh, a need for our parents in our community uh, to hear from our public officials like myself about what we are doing about it. Uh, in, and in my view, uh, any school security plan uh, is about a few things, right, uh, holistically speaking. Uh, it's about personnel. We should be funding uh, enough personnel, SROs, police officers, to take care, uh, there should be procedures. Um, you know, there should be policies uh, around, uh, you know, what we, what we have to do uh, in, uh, if we have to face uh, an event uh, which, uh, which, God forbid, never happens. Uh, we have to look at training, and we have to look at technology. All those things uh, are important in a holistic manner uh, to bring the solution we need today in the today's environment. If you don't have either one of them, I don't think we are doing uh, everything we can do. So I think technology piece is a big one. Uh, we have discussed some of that uh, at town council, uh, public safety. Uh, we have, we get, uh, I sit on the public safety committee, as you know, Henry. Uh, we get uh, regular reports from the police chief uh, who works really well and closely uh, with the Board of Ed. And uh, uh, we make sure uh, that uh, we have uh, training, going back to the idea of like having personnel uh, policies, procedures, training, and technology. We make sure that we, our, our police department has all those tools. Okay. How can a college education be made more affordable? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So I, I, 
like I mentioned in the in the in the in my intro, uh, as a, as I was introducing myself, I came to the United States as a college student, and uh, thankfully uh, I had a scholarship. But even with the scholarship, I still had fees and you know other just you know cost of living. So even with with my tuition being taken care of, uh, I had some debt when I came out of school. So I have uh, that recognition. And over the period of time, uh, even if you had a scholarship, uh, the things have gotten uh, to a point where like people still are taking out loans of fifty thousand dollars, and they have some kind of resistance, which is which is not the place where you want to be. So we can talk about why this is happening. Number one, uh, it's about state funding. Our state funding has remained flat for the last 20 years for many reasons. Recession was one of them in 20, 2008 in the middle. Um, and uh, if you adjust for uh, full-time education uh, per student, uh, it's about $12,000. And it has remained there for a while. So that's one. But it's not just the education spend of the state which we can talk about how much it should be. It's still higher, by the way, than a lot of other states. Uh, but uh, the most important part, which we forget sometimes, is the cost of living. Cost of living in this state, uh, the professors, uh, by the way, I'm an adjunct professor myself. I teach at the U UConn Business School. I'm a graduate of UConn, and I teach at the UConn Business School in the, uh, uh, a class in business statistics and predictive modeling. So I'm well aware of uh, college tuition costs uh, because I actually talk to the students every day <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what they're getting out of their uh, of what they're paying. So going back to like what are the solutions here, right? Like obviously the the cost of living, uh, cost of funding healthcare, cost of funding, uh, you know, uh, retirement, all that is part of the university's operational budget, right? So there is that. Then there is the idea of like, okay, if 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 we are increasing, uh, if making, making college available to everyone, uh, how are we doing that? Are we doing that through uh, loans, uh, which are backstopped by the federal government? Should we look at that? Maybe we should. I, I'm a big proponent of looking at everything and making sure I'm a data guy. Uh, and I want to look at that aspect as well. But talking about solutions, right? I think the big solution, big part of the solution are community colleges. I think we should look at community colleges as an entry point to four-year colleges, and that can bring the cost down uh, substantially, I think. And um, so that's one solution. And then the other solutions are just related to like, how you uh, how you are like, offering courses, uh, AP courses or otherwise, uh, during high school, which can be used as credit, college credit. So that's the other route. Uh, and obviously, I hate to say this, but I think we need to plan better as parents. And being a parent of a 13-year-old, right? We need to plan better for, uh, for college expenses as part of our financial planning. I think that's like the holistic view. I think, uh, you know, we should look at. Uh, that's, the, that's the vision I have, like, in terms of, like, what we can do about college college. Uh, uh, cost. Okay. Um, with a focus on our environment, electric cars, recycling, how can we educate everyone on its positive effects? Yeah, so I think it starts, it starts at, the, uh, at the elementary school, I think. Uh, I think we need to make, I'm a conservative. I want to conserve. Um, I, 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 I don't know about uh, not to like you know mix it up with political ideology, but as a conservative, I am a big proponent of conserving. We should be teaching our kids how to conserve better in terms of resources. And by the way, like I said, my 13-year-old is as guilty as anybody's kid in not conserving and uh, throwing away food waste and things like that. So I think the, it starts at home. It translates to school, uh, where we should be. Uh, telling them to conserve, telling them to recycle, uh, telling them to be more conscious of what they put out on our God's green earth. And uh, we should be talking about uh, effects of climate change, uh, which uh, I think is being, uh, has been codified into law. Like there, are, there is, I think, 2023, uh, they're going to start teaching about climate change in Connecticut schools. So I think, I think that is part of the solution as well, like talking more, uh, bringing more awareness to the kids at that level. Uh, and then also, like last but not the least, I think our teachers 
need to be plugged into like NASA, more plugged into uh, you know OSHA, like you know things like that. Like Oceanic Administration has like great. I, I was looking at like something for my my son, like he was doing some research, and it has some really like great resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, which our teachers can really very easy to find on YouTube. I think we should make it part of the uh, the curriculum, if you will. Um, again, it's a, it's a board of ed issue, so I don't want to overstep my bounds here. Mm -hmm. But as a parent, that's my opinion. All right. If a student prefers a trade school or not going to college, what is available for them? Yeah. So that's a great question. So it's it's I think. I talked about education at the front end of our conversation a lot. And when I say education, I don't mean college degrees, right? So college degrees are just one way to attain education. You can be very well educated without a college degree. And I think one way to bring, um, it, there are a few things you can do. And one of those is entrepreneurship. I think we don't talk about that as much as we should. I think uh, if you look at the data, uh, Again, I'm a data guy. I, I look at a lot of data sets for, for one reason or the other. And if you look at a few of the surveys with general social survey and like things like that, what you will find is that 50%, almost 50% of the entrepreneurs uh, in Silicon Valley and otherwise don't have a college degree. So it can be done. Uh, if you have that entrepreneurial spirit, we should, we should be fostering at an early age. And that is the age, like 17, 18, 19. I think Connecticut needs to have a program where we, maybe we work with UConn, maybe we work with CCSU, to encourage like, people who want to be entrepreneurs at that age and provide them the environment. Now, that will take to be a better business climate. Uh, I know this uh, discussion is not about that, <laughs> but we can have less regulation, less state mandates, and we can do way better uh, on improving our business climate. And um, these new entrepreneurs are not going to be immune to that, right? That business climate. So I think they go in together. But I think focusing on what we can do for people who don't want to go to college, I think that's a, that's a path. We should encourage that. We need it. We need more entrepreneurs in this state. Right. We need more small businesses in this state, right? So I think we should encourage it. Number two, um, we talk this, about this a lot. I think this, there has been a lot of conversation in the legislative session about this, uh, about uh, you know, having trade schools, right? Uh, apprenticeships in trade. Uh, I think that's a great idea. I think I fully 100% support that. If you want to go that route, if you're not an entrepreneur, you want to get a skill uh, which you can use to earn a living and be successful, you know? Uh, you should go to a trade school and just should be encouraged. Like you can do it in manufacturing, you can do it in plumbing, you can do it in like electrical, you can do it even in nursing. And on the related note, actually, uh, we have a shortage of nurses today, right? And one of the ideas I have been talking about on the campaign trail uh, is about a nursing delegation program. Uh, Oregon and some of the Western states already have programs like that, who, which actually are about uh, having uh, uh, nurse practitioners, licensed nurse practitioners, uh, hiring assistants to deliver uh, healthcare services, preventative services, uh, in nursing homes and senior homes, things like that. Mm -hmm. So that reduces the cost. It engages a different group of people uh, in the workforce uh, who don't have to go through like a four-year college and a, you know two years of uh, licensing and things like that. And you prepare those people to become lunch, uh, nurse practitioners eventually. Uh, through that program. So you are, you are solving a few problems at the same time. The shortage, nursing shortage, uh, cost reduction, at the same time you're bringing in people into the workforce. Um, and the last but not the least, the idea of, there is an idea of talent marketplace out there, which uh, I found it fascinating of you know, just putting uh, people who are uh, graduating from high school uh, and trade schools uh, and you know, match them to open jobs. And that is like, it's, it, it works like, you know, for lack of a better word, like an eBay. You just match the two, right? Uh, like a lack of a better analogy, I should have said. Uh, so yeah, those are the items like, you know, I think we can, we can, we can go with. So uh, definitely entrepreneurship, trade schools, uh, you know, we, we, sh we should look at those and we should definitely look at uh, programs like nursing delegation programs 
and uh, we should we should look at uh, talent marketplaces. Okay, and now finally, um, I'm going to ask you to say something positive about your opponent, and then give us your closing remarks. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I would say this: uh, Carrie and, and her family. Uh, I really admire their dedication uh, for public service uh, for many generations, uh, and I admire Carrie's. Uh, uh, you know, commitment to, uh, to that tradition. And I really admire, uh, I believe in public service, and I really admire uh, that coming from her and her family. So, uh, yeah, all, all kudos to her. Uh, so I wanted to, Henry, I wanted to talk about the biggest issue facing our state. And I think the biggest issue facing our state today is affordability. We are eighth most expensive state in the country. We are um, fourth highest utility costs. Uh, we have second highest tax burden in the entire continental United States. And we are 50th, the bottom of the pack, in income growth. We have a 25% increase in healthcare premium, as much as 25% increase in health premiums coming our way in 2023. And rents are soaring. Renters can't, can't afford them. They have like 20, 30 percent, you know, raises in rent uh, in the last few years. And our seniors and young people can't afford to live in this state. Anybody on fixed income or starting their career, we have a big "you're not welcome here" sign because we are so unaffordable. And I think. That, though, is, is a symptom of a larger problem. One party rule in our legislature over the last 40 years has impeded new and critical thinking. And we keep electing politicians and re-electing politicians who are recycling the same ideas from 30 years ago and voting with their party 98% of the time. So I would say this. Elections are about the future. And the biggest mistake we can make on November 8th is to vote for the same politics and the same people and hope for a different result. So I will urge people out there in Rocky Hill and Weatherspeed and all over 29 district to vote for change and vote for a new voice. Thank you. Thank you.